appreciate that. Happy 4th on the 5th. <laughs> Welcome home. And for those of you who are watching us either live or uh, on uh, Facebook, uh, maybe next Wednesday, uh, we're glad you're here and welcome home to you too. I saw a, a movie years ago called Back to the Future. Does anybody here besides me remember that? Back to the Future. And, and this man had developed this uh, automobile that could time travel. And so he sent the, the, one of the stars of the show, he sent him back uh, a long way back and it ended up if i remember it correctly uh, this guy his mother fell in love with him and he had to he had to get this uh, straightened out or he would cease to be so anyway he got everything straightened out and and they put him back in the car and he was going to go forward he was going to go back to the future and just before they shot him off the guy said now i want you to listen to this Whatever you do, don't stop in 2020. Whatever you do, don't stop in 2020. Now, as of last week, you've got 2020 about half over. And now you've got the future of 2020. And you have all these people, all these politicians, liberals and conservatives alike, saying we're going to make it through this because of the spirit of America and all of that stuff. Well, if 2020's been like this, what's 2021 going to be like? You are in a current that is driving you, dragging, and you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. They have, the government has interceded in your everyday life. They even tell you what to think, what to wear, what to say. Every, everything is turned upside down. In New York City, right now, you can kill an unborn baby and be celebrated by a hero of the Constitution and a hero of faith. But if you don't pick up your dog's byproduct, you can be arrested and fined. We have been turned up side down. And when I was thinking about July 4th, and I was asking God what to do, what to say, I remember World War II. That was probably when this nation was the greatest. And there was a current going along that Everybody was swept away. It changed everybody's life. You didn't have a choice. You had to get involved in that because the entire world was involved in that. And a few years ago, a man by the name of Ken Burns did a documentary on, yeah, PBS, if you can believe this. Never happened today. But he did a PBS on PBS called The War where he followed four families. And in that particular documentary, there was a song called the American Anthem, which we have people who don't like our national anthem. This is the American Anthem, sung by Nora Jones. And the first verse says, all we've been given by those who came before, the dreams of a nation where freedom would endure, the work and prayers of centuries have brought us to this day, what shall be our legacy, what will our children say? 
Let them say of me, I, and I can't help what they think in California. I can't help what they think in New York City. I can't think what they, I, I can't help what they think in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I can't help what they think anywhere else, but I can help what I think. I was one who believed. I'm sharing the blessings I received. Let me know in my heart when my days are through. America, America. I gave my best to you. Let me, let them say of me, America, America, I gave my best to you. And that video ends with some Marine in a ditch who has died in a far-off land who was buried in a cemetery where no one has ever visited. America, America, I gave my best to you. John F. Kennedy said to my generation, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. You and I have been raised for such a time as this. So I want you to turn in your Bibles today to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Where is that? Well, it's in the Old Testament. You open your Bible halfway. I learned this in Bible school. And uh, that should be Psalms. Of course, if you've got a cell phone, it's no problem, is it? And bless your heart, I use my, I have, I have multiple Bibles on my cell phone, and I read that all the time. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Never in the history of this world have we seen the issues of destruction and people yearning to go back so we can come up with some sort of a system, some, some foundation that we can go back, back uh, forward for a better way. And, but we have people, people in the church, people in government, people on both sides of the aisles, people in the streets, <laughs> people uh, on the television, people in the newsroom. They have no vision. They can tell you what's wrong. They can tell you what they don't like. They can tell you what they want to tear down. They can tell you what they want to get rid of. But they have no future for, no vision for tomorrow. I don't need to tell you what the news is saying. I don't need to tell you what I hear on the weather. Uh, but I do need to tell you there is a trumpet of eternity that is sounding in heaven. And that trumpet is saying, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, and Jesus is coming soon. If you look beyond the news, if you look beyond the future, if you look into eternity, Jesus is coming soon. And when he comes, he said, will I find faith upon the earth? When Jesus comes, will he find faith? Faith in your heart, in your life, in your church, in your home, in your day-to-day -day type of, of activity. 
First thing I want you to see is a day of disaster. A day of disaster. By the way, there is a solution to the disaster. A day of disaster. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them, verse 2, some of the Menuhites came against Jehoshaphat. He's the king of Israel, by the way, for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, now here you go, here's the news. A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazion Tamar, that is in Gedi. That means they're really close. They're just down the road. It was in ancient Israel. you, you got to know a little bit of the history to understand the spirit. And the tribes of the deserts, the Ammonites and the Moabites, who were descendants of an incestuous, yeah, you heard me right, incestuous relationship by Lot, the nephew of the father of a faith, Abraham, and if you don't know who Abraham is, ask any Jew and they can tell you. Ask any Muslim and they can tell you. He's Lot, the nephew of Abraham. He had looked at Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah was was a, a prototypical for what the United States of America is today. He had looked at Sodom and Gomorrah. He had moved toward Sodom and Gomorrah. He had moved outside of Sodom and Gomorrah. He had gone into and built a house in Sodom and Gomorrah. He lived in Sodom, and Sodom had gotten into him and had gotten into his family, and God sent an angel of the Lord as a result of the prayers of Abraham sent angels of the Lord and said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah a lot. They're totally bankrupt. They're a plague upon the earth. They're a spiritually toxic waste dump. And Lot, you better get out. And Lot, family, his sons and his daughters had married into Sodom. They had gone to school in Sodom. They had bought into the lifestyle of Sodom. They had the value system of Sodom. And they said, no, we're not leaving. And every one of them were destroyed. And then his wife, who had left and followed the angels out, decided to turn back and go back into Sodom. She said, I would rather have my so Sodom lifestyle and be in Sodom. And his wife turned back and God destroyed the whole thing. But Lot, the next thing, you find Lot and his two teenage daughters, they're in a cave. They're not too far from Sodom. And to show you how these women thought, how Lot's family thought, they led him to get drunk and then they both got pregnant by him, and they called the babies Amnon and Moab. And from the day they were born, they hated Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the sons of Israel, and they continually conspired to destroy them and take all their wealth and to destroy their spiritual legacy. That is why you hear in this day and time, you can't go to church. Is the Ammonites and Moabites are with us. America, America, you're not giving your best. The Ammonites and the Moabites are among us. Now, how did Jesus approach this? Yeah, since we are, uh, we are Christians, and, and our forefathers are Christians of the first century, they would rather die. Now, watch this. That you're going to have to think a little bit. They would have rather died than bow the knee to Caesar. You hear that? They would rather 
die than bow the knee to Caesar. And they did die rather than bow the knee to Caesar. And they did lose their property. And they did lose everything. But they did lose their faith. And they did go to heaven. And they're up there with, with Jesus right now. How did Jesus approach this? The night before Jesus' death. Now, I want you to listen to this. Jesus, Jesus said to Judas, who betrayed him, get up and do it. I'm not going to fight you on this. You go ahead and do it. He left. He conspired against Jesus. He conspired against God's people. He went to the authorities. He went to the governor. He went to the religious authorities, and they sought Jesus out, and he kissed Jesus. Like a snake uses its mouth to bite, he kissed Jesus. Like a serpent strikes, he used his mouth to kiss Jesus. He kissed Jesus. I want you to remind you, he kissed Jesus with his mouth. Peter denied Jesus with his mouth. Thomas doubted Jesus with his mouth. The disciples disrespected Jesus with their mouth. The religious leaders accused Jesus with their mouth. The authorities ridiculed Jesus with their mouth. The soldiers mocked Jesus with their mouth. And Pilate condemned him with his mouth. But Jesus was crucified, and on the cross, he prayed for them and for us with his mouth. So what is your mouth saying today? Not what do you think, not how do you feel, not what your, your uh, uh, vision is. What are you doing with your mouth? Before the crucifixion, before the garden, looking at Jerusalem, and on the cross, and after the resurrection, Jesus prayed for his enemies. Let me tell you what. The enemy of you and me is not CNN. The enemy of you and me is not Donald Trump. The enemy of you and me is not Obama or Nixon, or Clinton, or Bush. They are representatives of a system authorized and run by our enemy. And guess who our enemy is? You're going to have to look beyond this in your spirit. The enemy was Satan. The enemy is Satan. And Jesus was battling God all uh, battling with God Almighty for the souls of men. The Son of God was praying. The Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. The enemy has come. He wants you. He wants yours. He wants to destroy you. He wants to shut your mouth. It's a day of disaster because your mere presence condemns him to a hell that he can never return from. A day of disaster. Secondly, a day of decision. Can I get an amen? Somebody say amen to that. You know, I amen your song, so you amen my, my sermon. You know? It's a day of decision. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites and with them some of the Minyanites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. And some men came and told Jehoshaphat, now watch this, a great multitude is coming against you. Notice that. A great multitude is coming against you. Notice that. That shows how stupid people really are. Guess what? If they get Jehoshaphat, guess who else they're going to get? They're going to get everybody in Jerusalem. So the news people are telling us they're coming to get you. Guess what? If they get me, Chris Cuomo, they're going to get you too. If they can tell me what I have to preach or I'm going to die, they can tell you what you have to report. You know what Lenin called people like that? He called them convenient 
idiots. Lenin, by the way, is farmer, uh, uh, the father of communism. They want your stuff, but they want his stuff. And they want yours. It's, it's like the Germans in World War II, Hitler. First of all, they came, they killed the gypsies. Then they came and killed the Christians. And then they came and killed the German people. And then they came, then, well, first of all, they killed the Jews. And then Hitler killed himself. They lost it all. Listen, if America falls, and I believe she's going to, if you're black, you're going to fall. If you're white, you're going to fall. If you're red, you're going to fall. If you're yellow, you're going to fall. If you're Christian, you're going to fall. If you're an atheist, you're going to fall. If you are a Republican, you're going to fall. If you're a Democrat, you're going to fall. We're all in this boat together. If your ancestors came from Europe as indentured servants or were employees of the robber barons of the northeast or the black man sold to the Portuguese slave traders or the Chinese who came to build the railroads or the uh, Indians, not the Native Americans, but the people from India escaping the caste system. We're all in this boat together. And if the boat sinks, we're all going to drown. So if America, who is the enemy? The enemy is Satan, and he wants to kill us and in the process kill them too because he wants our souls and he wants our children's soul. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a multitude is coming against you. And from Edom and from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazon Tamar. That's, that's real close by. That, that's like downtown Charlotte. Listen, if they burn downtown Charlotte, they're going to burn Indian land too. You're next. If the communists killed the czar, then they're going to kill the rest of the people too. If the communists shuttered to the churches, closed the churches, They're going to close everything else that denies who they really are. You see, the enemy is Satan, and he has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And for all the trouble takers, and for all the power-hungry politicians, and for all the compromising preachers, the enemy wants to kill and steal you. But I want you to notice what Jehoshaphat did. Jehoshaphat did something that I've not heard anybody do. Verse 3 said, Jehoshaphat was afraid. And he set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. He was afraid, so he set his face to seek the Lord. Have you heard of anybody Say, we need to start fasting and seek the face of God in America today. Listen, there is no justice apart from Jesus Christ, the Messiah. There is no peace apart from Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We need to fast and seek the Lord. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah. And they came to seek. The Lord. Why? Because he was their only help. I wish I could play you that American anthem and show you Nora Jones singing that song. And it is against the backdrop of World War II. But this is what the second verse says. I can't do that because of copyright things. And before I married Phyllis, I could have played it and pled ignorance, but now since she is the legal analyst at INSP and she does all the compliance officer, she says, you can't do that. You're breaking the law and you're going to get fined and put in prison. For those who think they have nothing to share, who fear in their hearts, there is no hero there. No, each quiet act of dignity is taught which fortifies the soul of a nation that never dies. Let them say of me, I was one who believed in sharing the blessings I received. Let me know in my heart when my, let me know in my heart when my days are through, America, America, 
I gave my best to you. They decided to seek the Lord. Why? I want you to listen to this. If you don't know anything else, listen to this. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, by the way, the word Deuteronomy means say it again. God has said this again and again and again and again. God says, behold, behold. That means you better, you better get this. I want to give you a blessing today. Listen, I want, I, I want to give you a, a blessing today. I want, you to, I want you to know something. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Behold, stop what you're doing. Uh, that's why we have church on Sunday. That's why we have a Sabbath day on Sunday. That's why we, we, do, we, don't, we don't play golf and lay in bed and watch television and go to football games and everything else on Sunday. We come to church. Behold, stop what you're doing. That's why we, we have Sunday school. Stop what you're doing. That's not a suggestion. That's a command from God. Behold. To the Lord your God belong heavens and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. God owns everything. God is everything. God, God created everything. Satan will come and says, I have all the power. And, and God says, well, if you're so great, create something. Start, you know, you guys, if you're, if you're so great and you have this great vision and everything, you, you come to America and you create America. Uh, you, you, you do something. Uh, but you want to destroy creation. But th now go ahead. Cre just, just create a rock out of nothing. Now, you can't use anything. You got to just use your mouth. Your mouth, it's cursing everybody. You got to use your mouth. And let's make something. Go ahead. Make something. Well, I can't do that. And God says, you can't do that. I not only made a rock, I made the heavens, the universe, and everything that is in it, and everything that's ever been in it, and everything that ever will be in it. I made it a whole. Behold, the Lord your God well, watch this. To, you, to the Lord your God belongs heaven and earth and all that is in it. Yet, verse 15, here's where we're going. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection. Now, you have to know the original Hebrew to understand what that means. That word affection is just not a, a giddy feeling. That word affection is, is clinging to. Uh, that word affection is, is the idea of a mother who has a baby in her, her abdomen and she is connected to that, that baby with, a, with an umbilical cord. And everything that baby gets, uh, gets, he gets from his mother. And everything that baby, everywhere that baby goes, she goes with her mother. I cling to you. Why? In order to support you. Why? In order to protect you. Why? In order to prosper you. Why? In order to nurture you. Why? So you'll be safe and secure because, and why does a, a mother do that? She does that because that's natural. That's a God-given nurturing ability. Listen to me. Listen to me. God is clinging to you right now. If you're saved, if you're a believer, he's clinging to you right now. Be careful who you trust. I want to remind you, salt and sugar look the same. Salt and sugar look the same. In our house, we have two little things, and in one of them sugar and one of them salt. Have you ever taken the salt and put it in your tea? It doesn't taste good. Salt and sugar look the same. Satan comes as an angel of light. He gives you, he says, I've got knowledge, I've got deliverance, I'm promising all these things remind you, if you're in an abusive relationship right now, just stop and think about it. You say, well, I'm staying in that relationship because, because, uh, because I just love them. Because you love somebody does not mean that you should stay in a relationship because what you don't, you don't need a giddy feeling. Love is not all you need. You need respect. You need reassurance. You need comfort. You need security. You need joy. You need to know that every day that God, God has decided that you're his favorite 
person, and he is what you need, and you are what he needs. You need to learn to love your God, and you need to learn that your God loves you, and you need to start saying, thank you, God. Get into the Word and express that love to God. God will carry you through. God will carry you through the darkness. He's got you up in his arms. He'll carry you over the volcano. He'll carry you through the flood. He'll carry you into his great heaven. I want you to know that Satan is doing everything he can to keep get you into hell and keep you out of heaven. And God has done and is doing everything he can to keep you out of hell and get you into heaven. So there's a choice right now for your future is heaven and hell, God and Satan. Just, just, just make it simple. That's a day of disaster, a day of decision, and a day of deliverance. By the way, this is not popular. This is not how you grow a church preaching stuff like this. But, you know, we're not looking at a budget here. I don't care whether you pay me or not. How's that? I don't do this for money. I do this because I'm called. We're not trying to be the biggest church in Charlotte. By the way, I pastored the biggest church in Charlotte, didn't I? Didn't I? I pastored the biggest church in the Carolinas. I pastored one of the ten fastest growing churches and one of the biggest churches in America. I, I pastored one of the top 100 churches in the world. But let me tell you what. We need to keep our focus on the Lord and not on the Edomites, and not on the Ammonites, and not on the sons of Satan. We are the people of God. We have a vision from God, and we praise the Lord God of heaven. So what did they do? It's a long scripture, and I'm not going to read it to you because you'll go to sleep. I'm just going to tell you the story. A prophet, a preacher, some little old guy that had been turned out of a big church, dared to stand up in the middle of the square in a no place in Jerusalem, surrounded by the enemy, and said, this is a word from the Lord. Tomorrow, I want you to go out. And I love this part. I love this part. Don't put that officer of the United States Navy like I was out in the front. Don't, don't, don't put him out in the front. Don't send the Marines in. You know what he said? He said, put the choir out in the front. <laughs> send the choir. Da, da, da. I, I, can, I can get in on this, buddy. Because I, I don't, I've never been a part of a music ministry. I, now I, I can't sing. So send him down there. Let him sing, you know. You say, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I know it. That doesn't, uh, you, you know, I would say, all right, get you, get you a bunch of Abrams tanks and get you some, uh, uh, some Apache helicopters and get, get, you, get you some ammunition and get you some artillery, soften them up and go down there and just surprise them. You know, I'd, I would have done that. And he said, no, put the choir out front and let them go down there. And the people started thanking God, and the singers went before, and they started praising God. And the Edomites and the Moabites and all the otherites went absolutely crazy. And rather than tearing down the temple, they turned on each other. You see, when you start using your mouth to praise the Lord and not complain and grumble, it drives Satan crazy because he does not want you to be happy. He does not want you to be successful, and he does not want God to be praised. And they praised the Lord, and the Edomites and the Moabites turned on each other, and the people of Israel, what was going to be an economic disaster, went in and they got all their gold, they got all their silver, they got all their clothes, they got all their belongings, and they got all their food, and it was one great day in Jerusalem. When Abraham Lincoln was in the darkest days 
of the Civil War. He prayed. He went to church. He went to that church across the street, and he prayed. They actually prayed in that church during that time. He prayed, and he said for the nation, we need to pray. He said not only to the north but to the south, we need to pray. We need to pray. When we stormed the beaches of Normandy in World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt went on on the radio and said we need the churches were packed with people praying. When George Bush number one turned our military might against Saddam Saddam Hussein the first time the kick came out of out of uh, out of out of Kuwait, he he wanted us to pray and the churches were packed with people to pray and praising God. But today. The news media, the politicians tell us to go to the streets and kill, steal, and destroy. Who, America, who are you following today? I want you to bow your head, and I want you to close your eyes. If we will not pray today to God, then there will come a day, there will come a day, according to the Bible, when all we have to do is pray, but there won't be anybody listening. It'll be over. So today, will you determine in your heart and your soul that you're going to pray? You're going to be thankful to God. You're going to start off by just being thankful to God and then praise God for what He has done and what He is doing. Praise Him because He's clinging to you. Praise Him because He's holding you. Praise Him because He's got His arms around you. Praise Him because He's got you in His heart. Praise Him because He's got you in His bosom. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Your family might not praise him, but you do. Your family might curse you for doing that, but you praise him because he is not your help. He's your only help. He's not your hope. He's your only hope. He's not your your deliverer. He's your only deliverer. You don't have anything but God and God alone. So praise him and pray to him and be thankful to him and gather together and encourage one another to pray, not grumble, pray, not complain, to pray to God for the great blessings that he has bestowed upon us and the, and the blessing of his presence. Father, during this time of invitation, I pray that we would, we would be thankful and we would praise you today. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Standing as we sing our invitation, I want you to, I want you to just pray. And if you need to make a decision, concerning Christ, then pray, pray today.